namo buddhaya and welcome let us discuss uh, the i am discussing my learnings from this discourse uh, middle discourse is 39 the title of the discourse is longer discourse at asapura this discourse is basically intended towards mendicants who have left their lay life and went into homelessness so buddha is actually talking about what are the some true qualities uh, some qualities that in a true mendicant should possess right so buddha is saying that uh, 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 mendicants people label you as ascetics and when they ask you where what you are you claim to be ascetics but then buddha says that given this label and this claim you should train that like this that we shall undertake and follow the things that make an asset one an ascetic and brahmin that way our label will be accurate and our claim is correct any robes arms food lodgings etc for the sick that we use will be very fruitful and beneficial for the donor any and our going forth will not be wasted wasted but will be fruitful and fertile so buddha is actually talking about that you should live up to this uh, you know the the uh, label of an ascetic right because ascetic is someone who is treated as pure free from defilement people lay people give them arms and everything so you know they if they are the ascetic is pure the uh, lay person who is giving them the 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 donation or the charity will get the merit and also buddha wanted that if you are spending that much time that you have left your lay life and you have went on the homeless path then at least you should uh, you know reap that benefit of that and you should you know obtain the you should achieve the goal for which you have left the lay life so buddha is saying what you should do so buddha is basically in this discourse he is listing eight things so first is having consciousness conscience and prudence right having your inner conscience clear and your prudence that is there as to what is skillful what is not skillful right that is the first thing second our bodily behavior will be pure clear open neither inconsistent nor secretive we will not glorify ourselves or put others down on account of our pure bodily behavior so pure behavior by way of body is not doing any actions any harmful actions uh, through the use of the body like violence or sexual misconduct right we will not do this such actions we will live a pure life from the body we will also there is an, another thing that we will not glorify ourselves by through use of perfumes and adornments right because as per the monastic code this is one of the no nos right that you know because what it does is that it keeps you attached to the sensual pleasures and keeps you attached to the body right so uh, not to glorify our ourselves and also not to put others down you know on account of our pure bodily behavior maybe like commenting on someone else's you know body features or body shaming other person we will not do check that is the second thing third is about verbal behavior that our verbal behavior mental behavior livelihood will be pure clear open neither inconsistent nor secretive we won't glorify ourselves or put others down on account of our pure livelihood right so that is the third the verbal mental behavior right what you speak and what you think that also should be right right so it's though is addressed to mendicants it has its lessons for us as lay people also that whatever conduct that you have we either think or we speak or we act, act out of our body all three should be pure we should be mindful right so the essence here is being mindful of our thoughts speech and bodily actions on a day to day basis fourth is we will restrain our sense doors when we see a sight with our eyes we won't get caught up in the features or details if the faculty of sight were left unrestrained bad unskillful qualities of covetousness and displeasure would become overwhelming for this reason we will practice restraint we will protect the faculty of sight and we will achieve its restraint similarly when we hear a sound or when we smell or when we taste or when we know an idea of our mind we won't get caught up in the features and details right Sim- so this is very very important friends that buddha is al- always stressed that you know these five sense doors is where all the outside objects we take in and what it does is that it activates if if we are not mindful then the contact that happens gives rise to a feeling which is a pleasant feeling or an unpleasant feeling right and that feeling gives rise to desire or aversion right either you desire you cling 
to that particular thing or you run away and this basically creates another you know this keeps the chain of dependent origination running you can read about dependent origination there is a it's like a wheel right so the the sense object when it contacts the outside object there is the feeling that arises so when the feeling that arises so first of all we will be restraining our senses right we will be restraining our senses we will not look at things that can generate lust in us we will not speak something which can create hurt in another person we will not listen to any gossip that can generate ill will in us so we have to restrain our all five sense tools right because this restraint is if we cannot maintain that restraint then the latent tendencies will and even if we are engaging in the outside world we cannot totally restrain ourselves we will be mindful for example if you are looking at a at a beautiful woman outside and so you will also be mindful of the feelings that are generated of for example feelings or the lust or the you know those feelings of pleasant feelings of lust or something you be mindful and they do this as a practical example the moment you become mindful of that particular feeling it just goes down it just becomes clear it's like you are shining a light in a dark room and those feelings you know all those things disappear that's why mindfulness is the biggest biggest protection that we have right so that is the fourth thing fifth thing we will not eat too much we will only eat after reflecting rationally on our food we will eat not for fun indulgence adornment or decoration but only to sustain this body to avoid harm and to support our spiritual practice in this way we will we shall put an end to the old discomfort and not give rise to new discomfort and we will live blamelessly and at ease so in another discourse buddha had talked about that he talked about his own experience that i will i eat only one day once a day right and it keeps me very hale and hearty and he also asked the monks that they can also follow the same practice now initially initial set of monks that buddha had they were very kind of um, uh, diligent so they they started following but later set of monks there were certain monks that were you know not very um, uh, open to accepting this suggestion so finally this had to be made a part of the vinaya the monastic code right so buddha always advocated restraint in so buddha never never said about fasting and all because buddha advocated the middle way right neither too much of extreme austerities and all right Most, like like it is there in the jain tradition right too much of extreme austerities is also not there neither too much indulgence in the in the sensual pleasures so he he said moderation of food only that much food you should eat eat that sustains your spiritual practice and there is this uh, japanese uh, thing Uh, about uh, uh, japanese people what they do and you know this is i, I think it's even mentioned in the ayurveda that only eat up to like 75 to 80% leave 20% do not eat till you are full and the benefit of eating once a day this i have myself experienced i have started eating once a day eat a full meal once like maybe at 1 o'clock or whatever if you can eat by 12 noon that is nothing like that eat once a meal and maybe like in the evening you can have some small snack along with a cup of tea or coffee coffee not coffee i will not say coffee because it can interfere in the sleep but some tea or some light refresh refreshment that you can have at around 5 pm or 6 6 pm that is not like it's not only for monks but even for us it is helpful in our spiritual practice right so that we can start doing as see your own convenience how how you can do but the evening meal uh, and if if you can make it a bit early and make it very light right just so that you, you know you don't feel hungry right you can just eat then point number 6 we will be dedicated we will reflect rationally on our food right reflect rationally from our food is that seeing this food as it is it's a you know combination of so many non food elements like earth water sun clouds the 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 farmer's effort everything the the person who has made this food sir just reflect rationally on this food which has come on your plate what i do is that send gratitude send send wishes of peace and love to all those who have ensured that this food has come to my plate at least friends this we can do it just takes one minute right looking at the food just reflect on all these people and all these 
elements which have contributed and we send our love and peace that they may they be free of suffering may they be at peace only that prayer right okay sixth point we will be dedicated towards wakefulness when practicing walking and sitting meditation by the day we will purify our mind from obstacles in the evening we will continue to practice walking and sitting meditation in the middle of the night we will lie in lion's posture on the right side placing one foot on top of the other mindful and aware and focused on the time of getting up in the last part of the night we will get up and continue to practice walking and sitting meditation purifying our mind from obstacles okay so this is basically wakefulness the practice of mindfulness while walking sitting meditation keep purifying your mind from the obstacles right so one of the things that we need to be mindful of go back to the middle discourses 10 sadhipadana sutta discourse on the four formations of mindfulness very very important sutta if you want to practice mindfulness in a proper way in that the the last mindfulness what so you practice basically mindfulness of the body mindfulness of uh, feelings mindfulness of mind which is the mental state and fourth is ma- mindfulness of objects of the mind or mindfulness of principles which is nothing but the there are various things like the hindrances like there are hindrances like sensuality uh, then ill will restlessness right sloth right these things we need to be mindful even of that that when they arrive we will keep being mindful of that as well so that's uh, so friends our practice is vipassana meditation know whatever is arising right now just be mindful in this moment only you know just it's like our focus is in this moment and one by one one by one whatever is arising we are mindful right then seven number we will have situational awareness and mindfulness we will act with situational awareness when going out and coming back when looking ahead and aside when bending and extending the limbs when bearing the outer robe bowl and robes when eating drinking chewing and tasting when urinating and defecating while walking standing sleeping waking speaking and keeping silent right so this is very very important again it is part of the uh, middle discourses 10 satyapathana sutta that buddha asks us to maintain a my, my, my situational awareness standing walking going from here to there turning sitting right at all times try to have mindfulness of your body posture right now initially it may be become difficult but over practice it becomes easy one thing what helps is become a bit slow in your movements and like if you even if you are moving from one place to another be mindful so slow by slow try to get this into a you know habit right being mindful this is like you are arising this force of mindfulness in you this force will counter the entire karmic force that you have brought your brought with yourself together in this life and when your mindfulness is so so strong this whole the the, the karmic force that has come till now will will vanish right uh, because of the power of mindfulness right so that we make it as a work practice so this is not only only for the mendicants this is all what we have to also do in our daily life right okay and don't don't think that only when i become a mendicant i will leave my home for this lay life uh, sorry for the homeless life then i will do no absolutely not right wherever you are is the right time just start doing that right okay uh, eighth is free, uh, mendicant who frequents a secluded lodging right that means basically going in seclusion right and then meditating right they meditate and so it's about meditate meditation and everything giving up the five hindrances and all i'm just taking up the main main points otherwise it's a it's a long discourse then they go into the first second third and fourth absorptions or the four jhanas and finally they achieve the the three knowledges that you know the knowledge that of the recollection of the past lives and the knowledge of the death and rebirth of sentient beings then the knowledge of the four noble truths so this is what the knowledge that buddha also got right once in the after he went on the fourth absorptions he got the three knowledges and he became free so buddha is actually telling the path right so buddha now t- talks about the various kinds of names uh, that people call ascetic brahman badhd initiate knowledge master scholar noble one perfected one so buddha talk buddha says about the real meanings of these words for example uh, who is an ascetic 
Ascetic is the one who is assuaged, means removed the bad, unskillful qualities. Who is a Brahmin? Who has banished the bad, unskillful qualities? Buddha always said, Brahmin is not by birth. Brahmin a person becomes when he frees himself from the defilements. Right? So, just by birth, if you say yourself, you are a Brahmin and you are, you, you have all the right to take, you know, do the rites and rituals and, you know, no, that's not, it's basically a person who is free from the defilements. That person is an entire chapter in, towards the end of the Dhammapada verses, which is on the Brahmin. You can check that, uh, around 400 to 423 verses, uh, is, there is a full, like, around 20 verses which are on this topic itself. As to who is a Brahmin, who, who is a Baal's initiate, again, who a person who has, it's not the person who has just bathed in some water, holy water. It's a person who has bathed out the bad, unskillful qualities. Who is a knowledge master, who have known the bad, unskillful qualities, right? Then who is a scholar, who has scoured off the bad, unskillful qualities? Who is the noble one? They have nobled their foes, right? I think removed, maybe the, the word is removed. Perfected one, they are impeccably removed, remote from the bad, unskillful qualities. Right? So again, Buddha's focus is just don't, uh, you know, uh, remain kind of a cocooned or com in a comfort zone of the labels that you are given by the people. Live up to these labels, clear your negative qualities, right? and make it a worthy life uh, that you are living as an ascetic. So I hope this video was useful to you. It had some insights for your view. Do share the insights in the comment section. And thank you so much for watching this video. Namo Buddhaya Namo Buddhaya.